Chapter 18 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 18, Missouri Guerrillas and Politics. When Halleck went from his department headquarters at St. Louis to take command of the Union armies in Tennessee and begin his Corinth campaign, he left with General Schofield as his sole instruction the brief injunction to take care of Missouri. Practically, Schofield had already for some months been charged with this duty by virtue of his command and supervision of the Missouri State Militia, which he had organized under the special agreement between the governor of that state and the president. The Missouri delegation in Congress, foreseeing the troubles likely to arise, asked the President to give Schofield independent command in the state during Halleck's absence. Lincoln referred the question to Halleck. Halleck's jealousy of authority comes out strongly in his reply. Quote, I would rather resign than have him given an independent command in my department. End quote. Nevertheless, as Halleck not only remained in the field, but was in the following July transferred to Washington, the change was so far made as to erect Missouri, except three southeastern counties, into a separate military district, of which Schofield was given command. His instruction to take care of Missouri was not easy of execution. The social, political, and military disorders sprang from a tangle of conflicting sentiment and irreconcilable factions. At the bottom lay the hatred and daring of an active secession minority. Their sympathies and desires, springing from bitter pro-slavery intolerance, had created as a natural reaction an intense anti-slavery opposition, forming the basis and strength of the Missouri Unionists. But the Union Party also counted in its ranks many men of moderate pro-slavery views, whose conservatism, the aggressive anti-slavery radicals, were very little disposed to humor or tolerate. Minor causes of complication and rivalry existed in the former issue and revocation of the proclamation of Fremont, in the defense or condemnation of his military acts, in the support or the criticism of Halleck's Order Number no. 3, in the personal quarrels between the respective adherents of Fremont and Blair. These factions and their subdivisions so far mentioned had their main strength in the city of St. Louis and in the river towns of the Mississippi, forming a fringe along the eastern border of the state. Along its western border, near the dividing line between Missouri and Kansas, a somewhat different condition prevailed. There the dragon's teeth, sown in the days of the border ruffians, were yet yielding a baleful harvest of illicit arms and private vengeance. The complaints in former years of border ruffian forays from Missouri into Kansas were, as soon as the Civil War began, paid with interest by a continual accusation of incursions of Kansas jayhawkers and redlegs into Missouri. It was alleged that, under pretense of military service in the Union cause, they plundered the dwellings, stole the horses, and ran off the slaves of the neighborhoods they visited, without nice discrimination between the loyal and disloyal. They, on the other hand, retorted that such accusations came from men who with willful deception preached unionism in public and practiced rebellion in secret. Midway through the state, or rather in a diagonal belt from southwest to northeast, lay the pathways and haunts of the guerrillas proper, along which surged irregularly and spasmodically the incursions and risings of partisan leaders and their bands of secession bushwhackers. During the winter of 1861, the military activity which attended the organization of the governor's Missouri State Militia, combined with the inclemency of the season, had served to maintain a reasonable quiet. But with the opening mildness of the summer, secession manifestations once more began to increase. The drilled United States regiments were mostly sent away to reinforce the Tennessee armies. Curtis, having won the decisive battle of Pea Ridge, was penetrating into Arkansas and by that movement leaving southern Missouri without the controlling influence of a military force. The very completeness of his victory also produced a resort by the enemy to methods of warfare which bore pernicious fruits in Missouri. Not only did the Battle of Pea Ridge scatter and demoralize the rebel forces, which were for the moment united in that encounter, 
but the fragments of Van Dorn's army were soon afterwards entirely withdrawn from Arkansas to assist in stemming the tide of disaster in Tennessee. An official report of the Confederate commander, T. C. Hindman, draws a strong picture of the complete wreck of Confederate power and authority in Arkansas, which followed the Union victory of Pea Ridge, or as the rebels named it, Elkhorn Tavern. Quote, the governor and other executive officers fled from the capital, taking the archives of the state with them. The courts were suspended, and civil magistrates almost universally ceased to exercise their functions. Confederate money was openly refused, or so depreciated as to be nearly worthless. This, with the short crop of the preceding year and the failure on all the uplands of the one then growing, gave rise to the cruelest extortion in the necessaries of life and menaced the poor with actual starvation. These evils were aggravated by an address of the governor, issued shortly before his flight, deprecating the withdrawal of troops and threatening secession from the Confederacy. End quote. No single incident conveys so vivid an idea of the sudden weakening of resistance to the Union flag in the trans-Mississippi country, and none conveys a more striking idea of the geographical vastness of the conflict than that here was an empire of territory which the side in possession could not defend and the side in rightful authority could not occupy. If, at that critical juncture, McClellan had possessed the courage and skill to capture Richmond, and Halleck the genius and boldness to open the Mississippi, for the achievement of which successes the country and the administration had furnished both these generals armies sufficient in numbers, the rebellion could scarcely have maintained any cohesion beyond the year 1862. But McClellan failed, and Halleck's plans and orders threw the Western armies into a deplorable attitude of defense and delay, which left the enemy at all points time to renew their confidence and recruit their offensive strength. To a certain extent, they availed themselves of this advantage in Arkansas and Missouri. The rebel General Hindman arrived at Little Rock about the end of May 1862 with orders to revive the Confederate cause, though, if we may believe his report, he found little encouragement in his surroundings. Quote, in the existing condition of things, he wrote, General Beauregard could not spare me a soldier, a gun, a pound of powder, nor a single dollar of money. End quote. His own report admits that he remedied his difficulties to a small degree by exercising the unlimited authority of a military dictator, for which usurped powers and needless rigor he was censured by Jefferson Davis. The more noteworthy point of his report is the following frank language. Quote, With the view to revive the hopes of loyal men in Missouri, and to get troops from that state, I gave authority to various persons to raise companies and regiments there, and to operate as guerrillas. They soon became exceedingly active, and rendered important services, destroying wagon trains and transports, tearing up railways, breaking telegraph lines, capturing towns, and thus compelling the enemy to keep there a large force that might have been employed elsewhere." End quote. The desperate policy and the barbarous orders of this character employed by certain Confederate officers must be held responsible for the horrors so deplorably common in the state of Missouri during the entire period of the rebellion. We have seen how General Price began this unlawful system of hostilities during the year 1861, and how the orders of Halleck defined and punished such crimes. Hindman's order brought a renewal of the system, which soon created danger and turmoil in many parts of the state. Severe remedies became necessary. Quote, the time has passed, said an order of General Schofield, May 29, 1862, when insurrection and rebellion in Missouri can cloak itself under the guise of honorable warfare. The utmost vigilance and energy are enjoined upon all the troops of the state in hunting down and destroying these robbers and assassins. When caught in arms, engaged in their unlawful warfare, they will be shot down upon the spot. End quote. But the evil still continued to grow and on the 23rd of June, General Schofield ordered further, quote, The rebels and rebel sympathizers in Missouri will be held responsible in their property, and, if need be, in their persons, for the damages that may hereafter be committed by the lawless bands which they have brought into existence, subsisted, encouraged, and sustained up to the present time. These lawless bands could not exist in Missouri a single week, but for the aid of influential and wealthy sympathizers, 
many of whom have taken the oath of allegiance to the United States, only to violate its spirit while they observe its form, so far as to escape punishment. If these people will not aid in putting down the demon they have raised among us, they must pay the damages. The sum of $5,000 for every soldier or Union citizen killed, from 1000 to 5000 for every one wounded, and the full value of all property destroyed or stolen by guerrillas, will be assessed and collected from the class of persons described above and residing in the vicinity of the place where the act is committed. End quote. Notwithstanding all the vigilance the general could exercise, disorders and signs of danger from guerrillas increased to such a degree that, about a month later, July 22, 1862, an order was issued by authority of Governor Gamble to enroll and organize the entire militia of the state, so that any portion of it might be ready to be called into active service in threatened localities. This organization, exclusively under state laws, became known by the general term of enrolled Missouri militia. Two separate corps of militia were thus called into existence in Missouri, the distinction between which it is necessary to bear in mind. The Missouri State Militia was that organized under the agreement of the governor and the president, and which was armed, clothed, and subsisted by the United States, and kept in continuous service, to the number, as we have seen, of about 13,000 men. The other was the enrolled militia, exclusively the creature of state laws and state orders, and at the state's expense. Of these, more than 50,000 were enrolled, of which number 30,000 were armed, two-thirds of them during the same month the order was issued. In the organization and employment of this latter body, while it rendered much good service at different times and places, several chronic and irremediable difficulties were found. The state treasury was empty, and it was well-nigh impossible to collect taxes, hence assessments on the disloyal, and substitute money from those unwilling to serve, were resorted to for its expenses. The law permitted exemption for a year on the payment of thirty dollars, of which the better class of citizens naturally availed themselves. The more constant trouble was found to be the impossibility of excluding secessionists and secession sympathizers, or other unworthy and mischievous members, and it soon fell under a general suspicion and accusation of partial disloyalty, which, although unjust to the corps as a whole, was nevertheless too well grounded in relation to occasional individuals. The accusation was further strengthened by a curious blunder. The governor and General Schofield, among other precautions, ordered an enrollment to registration of those who had aided or encouraged the rebellion, intending thereby to render them more easy to be watched and controlled, and certain careless officials made the mistake of actually incorporating a number of these registered disloyal persons in the enrolled militia, an error which was of course corrected when it came to the governor's knowledge, but which appears to have existed long enough to cause many good Union men seriously to question the governor's motives. At first it was proposed to use this enrolled militia by keeping the whole under mere paper organization and calling into temporary active service only such portion of it as was in the locality where an emergency might require. It was found, however, after sufficient experiment, that under these conditions, organization was too loose and discipline too lax to produce proper efficiency. The expedient was therefore adopted, later on, of detailing from the whole body of enrolled militia ten provisional regiments whose members were chosen for their special fitness and loyalty, and these ten regiments were placed under General Schofield's orders, kept on continuous duty, and rendered efficient service. From this time onward, there is, in the local history of Missouri, such a confusion and contradiction of assertion and accusation concerning the motives and acts of both individuals and parties, such a blending of war and politics, of public service and private revenge, as frequently make it impossible to arrive at established facts or reach intelligent conclusions. But the chief agency in fomenting strife and producing crime was the persistent policy of Confederate commanders in prompting unlawful guerrilla warfare. The Missourians whom General Price had collected into his army of invasion in the summer and fall of the previous year, who were driven out of the state by Curtis during the winter and beaten and dispersed at the Battle of Pea Ridge, returned in great numbers to their homes and took the oath of amnesty to shield themselves from punishment for past offenses. 
however good their intentions may have been, many of them were once more lured from their pledges when Hinman's emissaries came among them in the spring, with new commissions and pretended Confederate authority unknown to recognized laws of war. Secret rendezvous were agreed upon and secret plans concerted, and a general guerrilla rising was already imminent when the governor's order of enrollment caused the whole movement to blaze into sudden activity. Quote, the desperate and sanguinary guerrilla war, says Schofield's report, which for nearly two months raged almost without cessation, may be said to have begun about July 20th, 1862, by the assembling of small bands under Porter, Poindexter, and Cobb, who immediately commenced to rob and drive out the loyal people. End quote. He estimated that their followers amounted in the aggregate to about 5,000 men, their operations being mainly in northeastern Missouri. His reliance to quell the rising was upon the state militia, already partly drilled, and the enrolled militia, just called out. Considering the difficulties of the task, it was accomplished with reasonable promptness. Quote, Porter's band, continues Schofield's report, was immediately pursued by our cavalry, almost without intermission, for twelve days, during which time he was driven a distance of nearly five hundred miles, and forced to fight our troops nine sharp engagements. End quote. This band seems to have been finally destroyed at the Battle of Kirksville on August 6th, with a loss to the rebels of 180 killed, about 500 wounded, and a large number taken prisoners or scattered. The cooperating band under Poindexter was next followed, its attempted junction with Porter foiled, and in a few days entirely scattered and its leader captured. Almost simultaneously, a rising having the same characteristics occurred near the western Missouri line, where the enemy, for a few days, had some temporary successes. They captured the town of Independence, and by a skillful concentration of their bands, defeated the Union detachments sent against them in an encounter at Lone Jack. The gathering guerrillas were shaping their campaign to repeat the capture of Lexington on the Missouri River. The movement, however, failed to affect this coveted result. General Blunt, commanding the Kansas troops across the border, was called into Missouri, and the converging Union columns drove the guerrillas out of the southwestern corner of the state into Arkansas. Though no great campaign was made, and though no great battle took place, it was nevertheless a service full of toil and danger. General Schofield reports that, quote, from the 1st of April to the 20th of September, our troops met the enemy in more than 100 engagements, great and small, in which our numbers varied from 40 or 50 to 1,000 or 1,200, and those of the enemy from a few men to 4,000 or 5,000." The dispersion and suppression of the guerrilla bands did not serve wholly to terminate local disturbances and offenses. The restraints of a common public opinion no longer existed. Neighborhood goodwill had become changed to neighborhood hatred and feud. Men took advantage of the license of war to settle personal grudges by all the violations of law, varying from petty theft to assassination. And parallel with this thirst for private revenge was the cupidity which turned crime into a source of private gain. It was alleged that horses stolen by secession guerrillas passed into the hands of doubtful unionists, and through the connivance of military officers were sent to St. Louis and sold to the government. Constant trouble arose also out of questions about slaves. Those of rebel masters in the Confederate service were free by the Confiscation Acts of Congress, but the difficulty of discrimination under conditions where the administration of civil law was practically suspended may readily be imagined. Military administration is complicated, even under favorable circumstances, and in a case like this, where at least two and sometimes three different organizations, the state militia, the enrolled militia, and the federal volunteers, were acting concurrently, questions of jurisdiction created inextricable confusion in right and responsibility. As a rule, serious local quarrels in any part of the country, whether of personal politics or civil or military administration, very soon made their way to President Lincoln for settlement, and Governor Gamble's Missouri militia, added its contribution of annoyance to his general burden. Towards the middle of September, rumors came from Arkansas that a new commander, Major General T. H. Holmes, had been assigned to the rebel force in that department, 
and that the governors of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas had held a conference and agreed upon a plan of concentration, which should once more unite as strong a Confederate army as their combined efforts might assemble in an active campaign to invade Missouri. Such a plan did not seem impracticable. The Union army under Curtis had found no large body of the enemy to dispute its march, but that march, for prudential reasons, had been changed from an advance against Little Rock to a descent along the White River eastward towards the Mississippi. This was good strategy so long as Vicksburg was the objective, but as soon as Halleck abandoned all thoughts of an expedition against that place, the army of Curtis necessarily fell into a merely defensive attitude. A rearrangement of military command appears in an order of the President under date of September 19, 1862, directing that Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, and the bordering Indian Territory should constitute a new department to be called the Department of the Missouri, to be commanded by Major General Samuel R. Curtis. Halleck, explaining the order to Schofield, writes at some length to exculpate himself from any inference of error or negligence by one of his periodical outbursts of indignation at politicians. Quote, General Curtis, as the ranking officer, he says, is given the command. This was the only way of cutting the knot. I was very much in hopes that some of the generals out there would gain some brilliant victory so as to cut off these pretensions of outsiders, but unfortunately nothing of the kind has occurred, and the cry is... Why keep in men who accomplish nothing? The only answer I can give is, why put in men who know nothing of military affairs? Under these circumstances, I have been obliged to leave things as much as possible in statu quo. End quote. This new arrangement served to change the relative positions of Schofield and Curtis. The former, gathering what troops he could, took the field in a campaign towards southwest Missouri to meet the expected invasion from Arkansas while the latter, recalled from a short leave of absence, came to St. Louis, September 24, 1862, to take up his new headquarters and assume the general administration of the new Department of the Missouri. In truth, the difficulties in the military situation had grown primarily out of the error of Halleck, heretofore pointed out, in postponing the opening of the Mississippi River. When in the spring and summer of 1862, Halleck abandoned all thought of pursuing that prime and comprehensive object, and left Vicksburg to grow up into an almost impregnable Confederate citadel, he blighted the possibility of successful Union campaigns on both sides of the Great River. That barrier stood as much in the way of a southward march through Arkansas as a southward march through Alabama or Mississippi. From the midsummer of 1862, therefore, until the fall of Vicksburg in midsummer of 1863, military campaigning in the trans-Mississippi country ceases to have any general significance. It resolves itself into the ordinary incidents of a contest between small Union posts of observation and the unceasing efforts of guerrilla leaders to create local uprisings and raids. For the Union troops and officers, it was a most laborious and dangerous service, bringing them nothing but vexation and discouragement and breeding only intrigue and jealousy among themselves, keeping them constantly hampered and thwarted in their wishes, and offering them no opportunities for advance, for success, for distinction. The facts pointed out by Halleck that no general had gained a brilliant victory was due not so much to want of merit or courage as to the restraints which closed every avenue that might lead to a decisive contest. The campaign against Vicksburg, so sadly neglected in the spring, was resumed in the winter of 1862, but by this time it had become the work of a great army, and required the genius of a great general. To aid in collecting this army, Missouri was drained of troops, and the task of repressing guerrillas fell largely upon local Union sentiment, which in the main found its organization and effective strength in the enrolled militia. The only action of importance which marks the military administration of Curtis was the Battle of Prairie Grove in the northwest corner of Arkansas, where, on the 7th of December, the detachments respectively commanded by the Union Generals James G. Blunt, who had been hovering all summer along the border of Kansas, and Francis J. Herron, who, finding Blunt pressed by the enemy coming northward with a view of entering Missouri, advanced by forced marches from near Springfield and formed a junction with Blunt, just in the nick of time to defeat the Confederates under General Hindman. 
The losses on each side were about equal, and on the day following the engagement, the Confederates retreated southward across the protecting barrier of the Boston Mountains. It was in a diminished degree a repetition of the Battle of Pea Ridge, fought in the preceding march, within twenty or thirty miles of the same place. In the main, it served rather to keep both sides within their respective military limits, preventing the invasion of Missouri by the rebel leaders in Arkansas, and reciprocally restraining an advance of the Union leaders into Arkansas for the purpose of seizing Little Rock, a movement constantly planned and desired by them, and yet in the nature of things inexpedient, if not impracticable, until Vicksburg should fall. While general history, therefore, can take little note of the endless skirmishes and raids in Missouri, which fill up the military record, the conduct of local military administration comes prominently into the foreground, not so much because of its intrinsic importance as through its indivisible relation to local politics, and through local politics to the great national questions of slavery and emancipation. The slavery question was indeed present as an ineradicable element of war almost everywhere, but in the state of Missouri, from the autumn of 1862, it not only supplemented, but in a certain degree even supplanted, the war itself. Curtis's earlier reports, made about two months after assuming command, are in a hopeful tone. With the approach of winter, the guerrilla troubles were diminishing. A quiet election had been held, the first since the attempted secession of Missouri, and adequate preparations existed to meet the threatened Arkansas invasion, which, as already stated, was repelled by the Battle of Prairie Grove. So effectually did this engagement serve to scatter the rebel forces that Schofield reported, January 31st, 1863, quote, There is no considerable force of the enemy north of the Arkansas River. Indeed, I believe they have all gone, or are going, as rapidly as possible to Vicksburg. 10,000 infantry and artillery can be spared from southern Missouri and northern Arkansas, end quote. Nevertheless, the administration at Washington was not free from trouble about Missouri, and, as was so constantly happening, the intervention of President Lincoln was sought to compose the questions of difference, in which other officials could not or would not come to an agreement. One of the matters at issue is briefly and pertinently stated in his letter of the 29th of November, 1862, to Attorney General Bates. Quote, Few things perplex me more than this question between Governor Gamble and the War Department, as to whether the peculiar force organized by the former in Missouri are state troops or United States troops. Now, this is either an immaterial or a mischievous question. First, if no more is desired than to have it settled what name the force is to be called by, it is immaterial. Secondly, if it is desired for more than the fixing a name, it can only be to get a position from which to draw practical inferences. Then it is mischievous. Instead of settling one dispute by deciding the question, I should merely furnish a nest full of eggs for hatching new disputes. I believe the force is not strictly either state troops or United States troops. It is of mixed character. I therefore think it is safer, when a practical question arises, to decide that question directly, and not indirectly by deciding a general abstraction supposed to include it, and also including a great deal more. Without dispute, Governor Gamble appoints the officers of this force, and fills vacancies when they occur. The question now practically in dispute is, can Governor Gamble make a vacancy by removing an officer or accepting a resignation? Now, while it is proper that this question shall be settled, I do not perceive why either Governor Gamble or the government here should care which way it is settled. I am perplexed with it, only because there seems to be pertinacity about it. It seems to me that it might be either way without injury to the service, or that the offer of the Secretary of War to let Governor Gamble make vacancies, and he, the Secretary, to ratify the making of them, ought to be satisfactory. End quote. Just a month later, the President, by a similar letter to Governor Gamble and an official order, finally disposed of the quarrel as here indicated. Meanwhile, as rapidly as he could, amid other pressing duties, Mr. Lincoln was grappling with another chronic Missouri difficulty. One of the most efficient means of controlling secession sympathizers of wealth and influence was a system of military assessments designed to prevent their giving assistance to guerrillas, as well as to compel them to bear their proper part of the burdens of war. 
grievous complaints however arose that this authority was being abused and the president felt that it was wise to remove as rapidly as possible all unnecessary burdens and temptations to oppression among the earliest directions to general curtis was a request to suspend the order of military assessments of august twenty eighth eighteen sixty two levying half a million of dollars on secessionists and southern sympathizers of st louis county to be quote, used in arming clothing and subsisting the enrolled militia when in active service and in providing for those families of militiamen and volunteers which might be left destitute end quote. he asked him at the same time to make out and send him a statement of facts pertinent to the question with his opinion upon it a few weeks later the president gave still more explicit directions to bring about a solution of this and other pending questions on the fifth of january eighteen sixty three he wrote to general curtis as follows quote, i am having a good deal of trouble with missouri matters and i now sit down to write you particularly about it one class of friends believe in greater severity and another in greater leniency in regard to arrests banishments and assessments as usual in such cases, each questions the other's motives. On the one hand, it is insisted that Governor Gamble's unionism, at most, is not better than a secondary spring of action, that hunkerism and a wish for political influence stand before unionism with him. On the other hand, it is urged that arrests, banishments, and assessments are made more for private malice, revenge, and pecuniary interest than for the public good. This morning I was told by a gentleman, who I have no doubt believes what he says, that in one case of assessments for $10,000, the different persons who paid compared receipts, and they found that they had paid $30,000. If this be true, the inference is that the collecting agents pocketed the odd $20,000. And true or not in the instance, nothing but the sternest necessity can justify the making and maintaining of a system so liable to such abuses. Doubtless, the necessity for the making of the system in Missouri did exist, and whether it continues for the maintenance of it is now a practical and very important question. Some days ago, Governor Gamble telegraphed me, asking that the assessments outside of St. Louis County might be suspended, as they already have been within it. And this morning, all the members of Congress here, from Missouri but one, lay a paper before me asking the same thing. Now, my belief is that Governor Gamble is an honest and true man, not less so than yourself, that you and he could confer together on this and other Missouri questions with great advantage to the public, that each knows something which the other does not, and that acting together you could about double your stock of pertinent information. May I not hope that you and he will attempt this? I could at once safely do, or you could safely do without me, whatever you and he agree upon. There is absolutely no reason why you should not agree. End quote. General Curtis held the interview with Governor Gamble as the President suggested, and his answer needs to be quoted in part to show the Governor's general policy and feeling as well as his own. Quote, in my interview with Governor Gamble, and in reference to persons charging him with selfish and ambitious motives, and doubts as to his fidelity, the Governor expressed his regrets and evinced generous sentiments of loyalty. He said, what is true, there is too much disposition now to impeach everybody. I think, with you, that Governor Gamble is loyal, and I do not see any occasion for us to differ, except it may be as to some measures. But even upon these, I do not think difficulty will arise between us. He goes for you and our country in some of your measures. I go for all. In regard to county assessments, he withdrew his enrolled militia publicly. I am checking them quietly. Our Union men here are much opposed to restraint in their pursuit of rebels, especially in the country where our friends have been persecuted, and where the assessments inure to the benefit of the widows and orphans of men killed by the rebels. There may be frauds, such as you name, but I doubt it. I should have had news of it. No assessment committee could commit such a fraud as you name with impunity. The calculation, I presume, is based on the supposition that men are assessed on the value of their property, whereas the assessments are made on a compound ratio of property and disloyalty. The assessments on persons for crimes committed in a neighborhood are considered a great restraint on rebels who have encouraged bands of rebels, and our friends fear that they will suffer if such restraints are taken off. I am implored not to remove them. 
I have earnest petitions and letters innumerable coming in, urging me to allow assessments to proceed. The county assessments are all made by local commanders, who claim that they understand their local difficulties better than I can. I therefore move cautiously and quietly, so as to avoid any new inspiration of rebel courage. On matters concerning the degree and direction of force against rebels, I am appealed to as the supposed head of military power in this vicinity. On complaints of too much severity, the Governor and Your Excellency are appealed to, and we do not, therefore, either of us, always see both sides. As to banishments, the Governor goes further than I do on that subject, although we might differ as to particular cases. Most of the banishments have been made as a commutation for imprisonments, determined by a military commissions or local commanders, and in all instances where the community seems to think it safe, I try to procure a release. End quote. In immediate connection with the question of military assessments, it is necessary to quote the General's explanation of the system of military provost marshals as one of the agencies of military government and administration in Missouri. Quote, the provost marshal system is not of my planting or growth, but it is now so old, deep rooted, and widespread, it cannot be summarily disposed of without danger of losses and disasters. It began in General Fremont's administration. General Halleck had given the system a head by creating a provost marshal general and issued some orders devolving specific duties on these functionaries. And by a kind of common understanding, provost marshals took charge of prisoners, watched contraband trade, discovered and arrested spies, found out rebel camps, and pursued and arrested the rebels in their neighborhoods. They operate with volunteers, militia, and police force, just as circumstances require, and in southern Iowa and large districts of Missouri, where recruiting guerrilla agents strive to organize their bands, they are the only stationary, permanent, official sentinels who keep me advised and guard the public safety. Public arms, prisoners, contraband property, and forfeited bonds are held by them and properly disposed of, an immediate discharge would create loss and confusion where everything is now quiet and secure. I regret that I am thus forced to defend a system I never did approve and have often condemned. I could not find either statute or military law to rest it upon. I have not appointed one except to fill the vacancy of the Provost Marshal General, but the system has started and grown up from surrounding necessities. It is now working very extensively and quite harmoniously, and I believe it must in some shape be continued during the war. When a nation is at war, war exists everywhere, and we must have some sort of military representatives wherever military offenses can be committed. It costs too much to keep stationary troops everywhere, but without such officers as I may trust and constantly employ in every county of this state and in various parts of my department, I must have many more troops in actual service in Missouri." End quote. Notwithstanding the very fair show of argument made by Curtis, the President followed his more liberal inclination, already indicated in his letter of January 5th, which indeed was with him a constant motive of action. On the 20th of January, he made, through the Secretary of War, a general order to suspend, until further instructions, all action upon assessments for damages, not merely in St. Louis, but in the whole state of Missouri, and the system was not thereafter revived. While with the progress of the war, local military questions were finding either a practical or official solution, and were, on the whole, diminishing in magnitude, a growing subject of irritation and discord presented itself in the question of emancipation. Brought into sudden activity by Fremont's proclamation of August 30th, 1861, it had since then remained a permanent issue. Not only the President's revocation of that military decree, but the later order, number three, of General Halleck, had been vigorously opposed and denounced by the more impatient and extreme anti-slavery sentiment of Missouri, for which the German population of the state formed a nucleus, important in numbers, and influential in intelligence and zeal. With President Lincoln's proposition of compensated abolishment, made to Congress in March 1862, the whole subject assumed a new prominence though as yet the weight of public opinion in the state at large was apparently averse to the proposition. In the State Convention of Missouri, which met June 2nd, 
the subject was taken up and a bill was introduced by mr breckinridge providing that all negroes born in slavery in the state after january first eighteen sixty five should be slaves until they arrived at twenty-five years of age and no longer unless sooner permanently removed from the state and providing also for accepting the offer of congress recommended by the president of compensation to the state and through it to the owners and for a vote of the people of missouri to accept or reject the ordinance it was hardly to be expected that the members of a convention elected at the beginning of the rebellion would be ready to act affirmatively on a matter not only proposing so radical a change but one still involved in such angry controversy and especially at the moment of a threatened guerrilla outbreak the bill was summarily laid upon the table by a vote of fifty two to nineteen it seems to have occurred to the conservatives before final adjournment that the course of the majority had been a little abrupt six days after this action governor gamble sent the convention a special message referring to the joint resolution of congress offering aid to the states as a proposition of unexampled liberality calling for a polite response and suggesting that the action of the convention might be represented as rudely discourteous to the president and congress and would without doubt be so misrepresented as to excite a hostile feeling to the state among all those in authority who favored emancipation and thus injuriously affects the interests of the state and he suggested a response that the people in choosing the convention never intended or imagined that the body would act on such a question accordingly on june fourteenth a resolution was adopted thirty seven to twenty three quote, that while a majority of this convention have not felt authorized to take action with respect to the grave and delicate questions of private right and public policy presented by the said resolution yet this body desires to recognize the liberality displayed by the government of the united states and to express its profound appreciation thereof end quote. while the members of the convention were thus veiling their dread of the dangerous topic in safe official phraseology a popular undercurrent was manifesting a substantial and practical interest in it wrought by the irresistible logic of daily events on the 16th of June, there came together at Jefferson City a mass convention of the more progressive politicians of Missouri, numbering about 175 delegates from some 18 counties. While the representation was small as to geographical area, it was important in personality and party influence. The primary objective of the gathering was to organize for the fall election, and seizing upon this question as the most available and pertinent issue, they adopted resolutions bringing the matter of compensated emancipation before the people, favoring gradual emancipation to be so initiated as not to injure pecuniarily any loyal citizen or occasion violent disruption of social relations, adding that the general government, by offer of aid, had relieved Missouri of all constitutional and financial embarrassment, and that the next General Assembly of the state should take measures to avail itself of the offered aid still the new idea was one confronted by such seeming obstacles in the traditions habits and material interests of the people that for the time it gained adherence slowly when on the twelfth of july president lincoln once more urged the representatives of the border slave states in washington his plan of compensated abolishment most of the missouri congressmen refused to entertain the project senator robert wilson and representatives james s rollins william a hall and thomas l price unionists and representative john s phelps democrat in their reply to the president pronounced themselves decidedly against the proposition in its present impalpable form while john b henderson unionist and representative john w noel democrat promised to recommend it to the fair consideration of their constituents before further important action occurred president lincoln's preliminary emancipation proclamation of september twenty second eighteen sixty two carried the question forward to a point of advancement not looked for by either advocates or opponents of the measure in that state from that time onward the issue was paramount in missouri as elsewhere not alone by the president's action of september twenty second but yet more influentially by his promised action of january first eighteen sixty three it was these military decrees of mr lincoln which lifted the emancipation party in missouri into a prominence in power for which it would have vainly labored without them 
thus reinforced that party at the general election of november fourth eighteen sixty two gained a decided majority in both branches of the legislature of the nine congressmen elected six were avowed emancipationists while a month later the emancipation candidate for speaker of the lower house was chosen by sixty seven against forty two in his annual message to the legislature, Governor Gamble declared his preference for a system of free over slave labor and recommended a modified plan of gradual emancipation, though he thought the legislature lacked constitutional power covering the full details of the scheme. These manifestations of Missouri sentiment also served to set in motion another agency which had no inconsiderable effect in advancing still further the great drift of political change the state was undergoing, and we shall better understand it by recurring for a moment to President Lincoln's policy of compensated abolishment. His special message of March 6th, 1862, recommending pecuniary aid to such states as would voluntarily emancipate their slaves, had been endorsed by the joint resolution which Congress passed on March 11th and April 2nd, 1862. Further practical legislation was also proposed. A joint resolution was introduced in the Senate, March 10th, to grant aid to the states of Maryland and Delaware, this being probably upon a suggestion by Mr. Lincoln that such a movement could be more easily begun in the smaller slave states. In the House of Representatives, the subject was taken up by Mr. White of Indiana, at whose instance a select committee on emancipation, consisting of nine members, a majority of whom were from border slave states, was appointed on the 14th of April and this committee, on the 16th of July, reported a comprehensive bill authorizing the President to give compensation at the rate of $300 for each slave to any one of the states of Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri that might adopt immediate or gradual emancipation. But as no popular response came from any of these states, and particularly as their delegations in Congress, in their interviews with the President, either opposed the scheme or only entertained it to the extent of a willingness to consult their constituents, neither House of Congress at that session took further action. When Congress met on the first day of December, 1862, such of the Missouri delegates as in the previous July were only willing to signify a hopeful promise, now felt themselves justified by the popular November vote to take up and advocate with energy the President's scheme. Accordingly, Senator Henderson on December 10th and Representative Noel on December 11th gave notice of bills to aid the state of Missouri in compensated emancipation. It would appear, however, that these gentlemen acted without agreement, for the bill of the former named $20 million as the sum to be appropriated, and that of the latter only $10 million. The House bill, naming $10 million, was passed on January 6, 1863, by a vote of 73 to 46, and sent to the Senate, where it superseded the Senate bill. The discussion of it was principally about the amount proper to be paid, Mr. Henderson still pleading eloquently for his original proposition of $20 million. The President's interest in this congressional legislation is sufficiently manifested by the following telegram, which he sent to General Curtis at St. Louis about this time. Quote, I understand there is considerable trouble with the slaves in Missouri. Please do your best to keep peace on the question for two or three weeks, by which time we hope to do something here towards settling the question in Missouri. End quote. A compromise was reached in the Senate fixing the amount at $15 million, and in this form it passed that body on February 12, 1863, yeas 23, nays 18. When this came back to the House, its select committee on emancipation could not report the new measure until February 25th. By this time, the session was nearly at an end. Three of the Missouri representatives, William A. Hall, Elijah H. Norton, and Thomas L. Price, strongly pro-slavery, and two of whom had failed of re-election in the recent popular change, still stubbornly opposed emancipation in general and the pending measure in particular. Their opposition, aided by Vallandigham and the dilatory parliamentary tactics of the Democratic minority, served to prevent its reaching a vote. It remained among the unfinished business of the session, and in the swiftly moving current of national affairs, no chance of its adoption ever returned. Meanwhile, the subject was also debated in the Missouri legislature, 
where, however, no decided action of any kind was reached. This was perhaps largely due to the fact that it was complicated by a personal contest over the election of United States senators pending in that body. As with everything else in Missouri, the president's interference was also invoked in this contest. On January 7th, Mr. B. Gratz Brown, a leader of the Radicals, telegraphed him, quote, Does the administration desire my defeat? If not, why are its appointees here working for that end? end quote. Mr. Lincoln, unmoved by the impertinence of the inquiry, answered quietly, quote, Yours of today just received. The administration takes no part between its friends in Missouri, of whom I, at least, consider you one, and I have never before had an intimation that appointees there were interfering or were inclined to interfere. End quote. But the embitterment had already become such that the legislature adjourned its session without effecting an election. Again, on the 16th of April, we find the president answering one of the complaining radicals who were determined to hold him responsible for all their local discord, quote, An answer to the within question, shall we be sustained by you? I have to answer that at the beginning of the administration, I appointed one whom I understood to be an editor of the Democrat to be postmaster at St. Louis, the best office in my gift within Missouri. Soon after this, our friends at St. Louis must needs break into factions, the Democrat being, in my opinion, justly chargeable with a full share of the blame for it. I have stoutly tried to keep out of the quarrel, and so mean to do. End quote. A month previous, the President had already sought a remedy for the Missouri quarrel in a change of the military commander. On the 10th of March, an order was issued relieving General Curtis and appointing General E. V. Sumner to take command in his place. This might have proved an acceptable substitution, for Sumner's well-known anti-slavery feelings would have secured him the confidence of the radicals, while his prudent firmness of character might have kept him free from charge of partisanship, but the transfer was frustrated by his sudden death, which occurred on the 21st of the same month at Syracuse, New York, on his way to St. Louis to enter upon this important command. End of chapter 18. Recording by Owen Cook in Potawatomi ceded land. Chapter 19 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 6, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 19. The Edict of Freedom. In his preliminary proclamation of September 22, President Lincoln had announced his intention to urge once more upon Congress the policy of compensated abolishment. Accordingly, his annual message of December 1, 1862, was in great part devoted to a discussion of this question. Without slavery, he premised, the rebellion could never have existed. Without slavery, it could not continue. His argument presented anew, with broad prophetic forecast, the folly of disunion, the brilliant destiny of the Republic as a single nation, the safety of building with wise statesmanship upon its coming population and wealth. He stated that by the law of increase shown in the census tables, the country might expect to number over two hundred millions of people in less than a century and we will reach this too he continued if we do not ourselves relinquish the chance by the folly and evils of disunion or by long and exhausting war springing from the only great element of national discord among us while it cannot be foreseen exactly how much one huge example of secession breeding lesser ones indefinitely would retard population civilization and prosperity no one can doubt that the extent of it would be very great and injurious the proposed emancipation would shorten the war perpetuate peace ensure this increase of population and proportionately the wealth of the country with these we should pay all the emancipation would cost together with our other debt easier than we should pay our other debt without it 
he therefore recommended that congress should propose to the legislatures of the several states a constitutional amendment consisting of three articles namely one providing compensation in bonds for every state which should abolish slavery before the year nineteen hundred another securing freedom to all slaves who during the rebellion had enjoyed actual freedom by the chances of war also providing compensation to loyal owners the third authorizing congress to provide for colonization the message continued the plan consisting of these articles is recommended not but that a restoration of the national authority would be accepted without its adoption nor will the war nor proceedings under the proclamation of september twenty two eighteen sixty two be stayed because of the recommendation of this plan its timely adoption i doubt not would bring restoration and thereby stay both and notwithstanding this plan the recommendation that congress provide by law for compensating any state which may adopt emancipation before this plan shall have been acted upon is hereby earnestly renewed such would be only an advanced part of the plan and the same arguments apply to both this plan is recommended as a means not in exclusion of but additional to all others for restoring and preserving the national authority throughout the union the plan is proposed as permanent constitutional law it cannot become such without the concurrence of first two-thirds of congress and afterwards three-fourths of the states the requisite three-fourths of the states will necessarily include seven of the slave states their concurrence if obtained will give assurance of their severally adopting emancipation at no very distant day upon the new constitutional terms this assurance would end the struggle now and save the union for ever we can succeed only by concert it is not can any of us imagine better but can we all do better object whatsoever is possible still the question recurs can we do better the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present the occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion as our case is new so we must think anew and act anew we must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country fellow citizens we cannot escape history we of this congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves no personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us the fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation we say we are for the union the world will not forget that we say this we know how to save the union the world knows we do know how to save it we even we here hold the power and bear the responsibility in giving freedom to the slave we are sure freedom to the free honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve we shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth other means may succeed this could not fail the way is plain peaceful generous just a way which if followed the world will forever applaud and god must forever bless no immediate action followed this patriotic appeal no indications of reviving unionism were manifested in the distinctly rebel states no popular expression of a willingness to abandon slavery and accept compensation came from the loyal border slave states except perhaps in a qualified way from missouri where the emancipation sentiment was steadily progressing though with somewhat convulsive action owing to the quarrel which divided the unionists of that state thus the month of december wore away and the day approached when it became necessary for the president to execute the announcement of emancipation made in his preliminary proclamation of september twenty two that he was ready at the appointed time is shown by an entry in the diary of secretary wells at the meeting to-day december thirty 
eighteen sixty two the president read the draft of his emancipation proclamation invited criticism and finally directed that copies should be furnished to each it is a good and well prepared paper but i suggested that a part of the sentence marked in pencil be omitted chase advised that fractional parts of states ought not to be exempted in this i think he is right and so stated practically there would be difficulty in freeing parts of states and not freeing others a clashing between central and local authorities it will be remembered that when the president proposed emancipation on the twenty second of july and again when he announced emancipation on the twenty second of september he informed his cabinet that he had decided the main matter for himself and that he asked their advice only upon subordinate points in now taking up the subject for the third and final review there was neither doubt nor hesitation in regard to the central policy and act about to be consummated but there were several important minor questions upon which as before he wished the advice of his cabinet and it was to present these in concise form for discussion that he wrote his draft and furnished each of them a copy on the thirtieth of december as mr wells relates this draft omitting its mere routine phraseology and quotations from the former proclamation continued as follows now therefore i abraham lincoln president of the united states by virtue of the power in me vested as commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the united states in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the united states and as a proper and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion do on this first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty three and in accordance with my intention so to do publicly proclaimed for one hundred days as aforesaid order and designate as the states and parts of states in which the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the united states the following to wit arkansas texas louisiana except the parishes of mississippi alabama florida georgia south carolina north carolina and virginia except the forty-eight counties designated as west virginia and also the counties of and by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid i do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward forever shall be free and that the executive government of the united states including the military and naval authorities thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons and will do no act or acts to repress said persons or any of them in any suitable efforts they may make for their actual freedom and i hereby appeal to the people so declared to be free to abstain from all disorder tumult and violence unless in necessary self-defence and in all cases when allowed to labour faithfully for wages and i further declare make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the united states to garrison and defend forts positions stations and other places and to man vessels of all sorts in said service it will be seen that this draft presented for discussion in addition to mere verbal criticism the question of defining the fractional portions of virginia and louisiana under federal control and the yet more important policy now for the first time announced by the president of his intention to incorporate a portion of the newly liberated slaves into the armies of the union mr wells's diary for wednesday december thirty one eighteen sixty two thus continues we had an early and special cabinet meeting convened at ten a m the subject was the proclamation of to-morrow to emancipate the slaves in the rebel states seward proposed two amendments one included mine and one enjoining upon instead of appealing to those emancipated to forbear from tumult blair had like seward and myself proposed the omission of a part of a sentence and made other suggestions which i thought improvements chase made some good criticisms and proposed a felicitous closing sentence the president took the suggestions written in order and said he would complete the document 
from the manuscript letters and memoranda we glean more fully the modifications of the amendments proposed by the several members of the cabinet the changes suggested in mr seward's note were all verbal and were three in number first following the declaration that the executive government of the united states including the military and naval authorities thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons he proposed to omit the further words which had been used in the september proclamation and will do no act or acts to repress said persons or any of them in any suitable efforts they may make for their actual freedom mr wells had suggested the same change second the next sentence which read and i hereby appeal to the people so declared to be free to abstain from all disorder etc mr seward proposed should read and i hereby command and require the people so declared to be free to abstain from all disorder etc third the phrase and in all cases when allowed to labor faithfully for wages he proposed should read and i do recommend to them in all cases when allowed to labor faithfully for just and reasonable wages the criticisms submitted by mr chase were quite long and full and since they suggested the most distinctive divergence from the president's plan namely that of making no exceptions of fractional portions of states except the forty-eight counties of west virginia his letter needs to be quoted in full in accordance with your verbal direction of yesterday i most respectfully submit the following observations in respect to the draft of a proclamation designating the states and parts of states within which the proclamation of september twenty two eighteen sixty two is to take effect according to the terms thereof one it seems to me wisest to make no exception of parts of states from the operation of the proclamation save the forty eight counties designated as west virginia my reasons are these one such exceptions will impair in public estimation the moral effect of the proclamation and invite censure which it would be well if possible to avoid two such exceptions must necessarily be confined to some few parishes and counties in louisiana and virginia and can have no practically useful effect through the operation of various acts of congress the slaves of disloyal masters in those parts are already enfranchised and the slaves of loyal masters are practically so some of the latter have already commenced paying wages to their laborers formerly slaves and it is to be feared that if by these exceptions slavery is practically re-established in the favor of some masters while abolished by laws and by the necessary effect of military occupation as to others very serious inconveniences may arise three no intimation of exceptions of this kind is given in the september proclamation nor does it appear that any intimations otherwise given have been taken into account by those who have participated in recent elections or that any exceptions of their particular localities are desired by them two i think it would be expedient to omit from the proposed proclamation the declaration that the executive government of the united states will do no act to repress the enfranchised in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom this clause in the september proclamation has been widely quoted as an incitement to servile insurrection in lieu of it and for the purpose of shaming these misrepresentations i think it would be well to insert some such clause as this not encouraging or countenancing however any disorderly or licentious conduct if this alteration is made the appeal to the enslaved may properly enough be omitted it does not appear to be necessary and may furnish a topic to the evil disposed for censure and ridicule three i think it absolutely certain that the rebellion can in no way be so certainly speedily and economically suppressed as by the organized military force of the loyal population of the insurgent regions of whatever complexion in no way can irregular violence and servile insurrection be so surely prevented as by the regular organization and regular military employment of those who might otherwise probably resort to such courses 
such organization is now in successful progress and the concurrent testimony of all connected with the colored regiments in louisiana and south carolina is that they are brave orderly and efficient general butler declares that without his colored regiments he could not have attempted his recent important movements in the la fourche region and general saxton bears equally explicit testimony to the good conduct and efficiency of the colored troops recently sent on an expedition along the coast of georgia considering these facts it seems to me that it would be best to omit from the proclamation all reference to the military employment of the enfranchised population leaving it to the natural course of things already well begun or to state distinctly that in order to secure the suppression of the rebellion without servile insurrection or licentious marauding such numbers of the population declared free as may be found convenient will be employed in the military and naval service of the united states finally i respectfully suggest that on an occasion of such interest there can be no just imputation of affectation against a solemn recognition of responsibility before men and before god and that some such close as follows will be proper and upon this act sincerely believed to be an act of justice warranted by the constitution and of duty demanded by the circumstances of the country i invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of almighty god it is not remembered whether mr stanton secretary of war was present at the cabinet meeting but he appears to have left no written memorandum of his suggestions if he offered any stanton was preeminently a man of action and the probability is that he agreed to the president's draft without amendment the cabinet also lacked one member of being complete caleb b smith secretary of the interior had lately been transferred to the vacant bench of the united states district court of indiana and his successor john p usher was not appointed until about a week after the date of which we write the memorandum of mr blair postmaster-general proposed a condensation of several of the paragraphs in the president's draft as follows i do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states shall be free and that the executive government of the united states including the military and naval authorities will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons and in order that they may render all the aid they are willing to give to this object and to the support of the government authority will be given to receive them into the service whenever they can be usefully employed and they may be armed to garrison forts to defend positions and stations and to man vessels and i appeal to them to show themselves worthy of freedom by fidelity and diligence in the employments which may be given to them by the observance of order and by abstaining from all violence not required by duty or for self-defence it is due to them to say that the conduct of large numbers of these people since the war began justifies confidence in their fidelity and humanity generally the memorandum of attorney-general bates is also quite full and combats the recommendation of secretary chase concerning fractions of states i respectfully suggest that one the president issues the proclamation by virtue of the power in him vested as commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the united states in time of actual armed rebellion etc and as a proper and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion date january eighteen sixty three two it is done in accordance with the first proclamation of september twenty two eighteen sixty two three it distinguishes between states and parts of states and designates those states and parts of states in which the people thereof respectively are this day january one eighteen sixty three in rebellion against the united states these three propositions being true i think they ought to be followed out without excess or diminution by action not by the declaration of a principle nor the establishment of a law for the future guidance of others it is a war measure by the president a matter of fact not a law by the legislature and as to what is proposed to be done in the future the least said the better 
better leave yourself free to act in the emergencies as they arise with as few embarrassing committals as possible whether a particular state or part of a state is or is not in actual rebellion on the first of january eighteen sixty three is a simple matter of fact which the president in the first proclamation has promised to declare in the record of course it must be truly declared it is no longer open to be determined as a matter of policy or prudence independently of the fact and this applies with particular force to virginia the eastern shore of virginia and the region round about norfolk are now december thirty one eighteen sixty two more free from actual rebellion than are several of the forty-eight counties spoken of as west virginia if the latter be exempt from the proclamation so also ought the former and so in all the states that are considered in parts the last paragraph of the draft i consider wholly useless and probably injurious being a needless pledge of future action which may be quite as well done without as with the pledge in rewriting the proclamation for signature mr lincoln in substance followed the suggestions made by the several members of the cabinet as to mere verbal improvements but in regard to the two important changes which had been proposed he adhered rigidly to his own draft he could not consent to the view urged by secretary chase that to omit the exemption of fractional parts of states would have no practical bearing in his view this would touch the whole underlying theory and legal validity of his act and change its essential character the second proposition favored by several members of the cabinet to omit any declaration of intention to enlist the freedmen in military service while it was not so vital yet partook of the same general effect as tending to weaken and discredit his main central act of authority mr lincoln took the various manuscript notes and memoranda which his cabinet advisers brought him on the thirty first of december and during that afternoon and the following morning with his own hand carefully rewrote the entire body of the draft of the proclamation the blanks left to designate fractional parts of states he filled according to latest official advices of military limits and in the closing paragraph suggested by chase he added after the words warranted by the constitution his own important qualifying correction upon military necessity it is a custom in the executive mansion to hold on new year's day an official and public reception beginning at eleven o'clock in the morning which keeps the president at his post in the blue room until two in the afternoon the hour for this reception came before mr lincoln had entirely finished revising the engrossed copy of the proclamation and he was compelled to hurry away from his office to friendly handshaking and festal greeting with the rapidly arriving official and diplomatic guests the rigid laws of etiquette held him to this duty for the space of three hours had actual necessity required it he could of course have left such mere social occupation at any moment but the president saw no occasion for precipitancy on the other hand he probably deemed it wise that the completion of this momentous executive act should be attended by every circumstance of deliberation vast as were its consequences the act itself was only the simplest and briefest formality it could in no wise be made sensational or dramatic those characteristics attached if at all only to the long past decisions and announcements of july twenty two and september twenty two of the previous year those dates had witnessed the mental conflict and the moral victory no ceremony was made or attempted of this final official signing the afternoon was well advanced when mr lincoln went back from his new year's greetings with his right hand so fatigued that it was an effort to hold the pen there was no special convocation of the cabinet or of prominent officials those who were in the house came to the executive office merely from the personal impulse of curiosity joined to momentary convenience his signature was attached to one of the greatest and most beneficent military decrees of history in the presence of less than a dozen persons 
after which it was carried to the department of state to be attested by the great seal and deposited among the archives of the government since several eminent lawyers have publicly questioned the legal validity of mr lincoln's edict of freedom as his final emancipation proclamation may be properly styled it is worth while to gather if possible mr lincoln's own conception and explanation of the constitutional and legal bearings of his act there is little difficulty in arriving at this his language embodied in a number of letters and documents contains such a distinct and logical exposition of the whole process of his thought and action from the somewhat extreme conservatism of his first inaugural to his great edict of january one eighteen sixty three and the subsequent policy of its practical enforcement that we need but arrange them in their obvious sequence the proper beginning is to be found in a letter of april four eighteen sixty four to a g hodges of frankfort kentucky in this he says i am naturally anti-slavery if slavery is not wrong nothing is wrong i cannot remember when i did not so think and feel and yet i have never understood that the presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling it was in the oath i took that i would to the best of my ability preserve protect and defend the constitution of the united states i could not take the office without taking the oath nor was it my view that i might take an oath to get power and break the oath in using the power i understood that too that in ordinary civil administration this oath even forbade me to practically indulge my primary abstract judgment on the moral question of slavery i had publicly declared this many times and in many ways and i aver that to this day i have done no official act in mere deference to my abstract judgment and feeling on slavery i did understand however that my oath to preserve the constitution to the best of my ability imposed upon me the duty of preserving by every indispensable means that government that nation of which that constitution was the organic law was it possible to lose the nation and yet preserve the constitution by general law life and limb must be protected yet often a limb must be amputated to save a life but a life is never wisely given to save a limb i felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the constitution through the preservation of the nation right or wrong i assumed this ground and now avow it i could not feel that to the best of my ability i had even tried to preserve the constitution if to save slavery or any minor matter i should permit the wreck of government country and constitution altogether when early in the war general fremont attempted military emancipation i forbade it because i did not then think it an indispensable necessity when a little later general cameron then secretary of war suggested the arming of the blacks i objected because i did not yet think it an indispensable necessity when still later general hunter attempted military emancipation i again forbade it because i did not yet think the indispensable necessity had come when in march and may and july eighteen sixty two i made earnest and successive appeals to the border states to favor compensated emancipation i believed the indispensable necessity for military emancipation and arming the blacks would come unless averted by that measure they declined the proposition and i was in my best judgment driven to the alternative of either surrendering the union and with it the constitution or of laying strong hand upon the colored element i chose the latter the question of legal and constitutional validity he discusses briefly but conclusively in his letter of august twenty sixth eighteen sixty three to james c conkling of springfield illinois in this addressing himself to his critics he says you say it is unconstitutional i think differently i think the constitution invests its commander-in-chief with the law of war in time of war 
the most that can be said if so much is that slaves are property is there has there ever been any question that by the law of war property both of enemies and friends may be taken when needed and is it not needed whenever taking it helps us or hurts the enemy armies the world over destroy enemies property when they cannot use it and even destroy their own to keep it from the enemy civilized belligerents do all in their power to help themselves or hurt the enemy admitting the general principle of international law of the right of a belligerent to appropriate or destroy enemy's property and applying it to the constitutional domestic war to suppress rebellion which he was then prosecuting there came next the question of how his military decree of enfranchisement was practically to be applied this point though not fully discussed is sufficiently indicated in several extracts in the draft of a letter to charles d robinson he wrote august seventeenth eighteen sixty four the way these measures were to help the cause was not to be by magic or miracles but by inducing the colored people to come bodily over from the rebel side to ours and in his letter to james c conkling of august twenty sixth eighteen sixty three he says but negroes like other people act upon motives why should they do anything for us if we will do nothing for them if they stake their lives for us they must be prompted by the strongest motive even the promise of freedom and the promise being made must be kept the actual tangible military result which he declares was his constitutional and legal warrant for his edict of military emancipation is set forth in the following extracts whether we judge it by the narrow technical rules of applied jurisprudence or by the broader principles of the legal philosophy of christian nations it forms equally his complete vindication in the draft of a letter to isaac m Shermerhorn, he wrote september twelfth eighteen sixty four any different policy in regard to the colored man deprives us of his help and this is more than we can bear we cannot spare the hundred and forty or fifty thousand now serving us as soldiers seamen and laborers this is not a question of sentiment or taste but one of physical force which may be measured and estimated as horse-power and steam-power are measured and estimated keep it and you can save the union throw it away and the union goes with it and in the one already quoted to robinson august seventeenth eighteen sixty four drive back to the support of the rebellion the physical force which the colored people now give and promise us and neither the present nor any coming administration can save the union take from us and give to the enemy the hundred and thirty forty or fifty thousand colored persons now serving us as soldiers seamen and laborers and we cannot longer maintain the contest so also in an interview with john t mills he said but no human power can subdue this rebellion without the use of the emancipation policy and every other policy calculated to weaken the moral and physical forces of the rebellion freedom has given us two hundred thousand men raised on southern soil it will give us more yet just so much it has subtracted from the enemy let my enemies prove to the country that the destruction of slavery is not necessary to a restoration of the union i will abide the issue we might stop here and assume that president lincoln's argument is complete but he was by nature so singularly frank and conscientious and by mental constitution so unavoidably logical that he could not if he had desired do things or even seem to do them by indirection or subterfuge this the most weighty of his responsibilities and the most difficult of his trials he could not permit to rest upon doubt or misconstruction in addition to what we have already quoted he has left us a naked and final restatement of the main question with the unequivocal answer of his motive and conviction it has been shown above how mr chase in the discussions of the final phraseology of the january proclamation urged him to omit his former exemptions of certain fractional parts of insurrectionary states 
despite the president's adverse decision mr chase continued from time to time to urge this measure during the year eighteen sixty three to these requests the president finally replied as follows on the second of september knowing your great anxiety that the emancipation proclamation shall now be applied to certain parts of virginia and louisiana which were exempted from it last january i state briefly what appear to me to be difficulties in the way of such a step the original proclamation has no constitutional or legal justification except as a military measure the exemptions were made because the military necessity did not apply to the exempted localities nor does that necessity apply to them now any more than it did then if i take the step must i not do so without the argument of military necessity and so without any argument except the one that i think the measure politically expedient and morally right would i not thus give up all footing upon constitution or law would i not thus be in the boundless field of absolutism could this pass unnoticed or unresisted could it fail to be perceived that without any further stretch i might do the same in delaware maryland kentucky tennessee and missouri and even change any law in any state in these extracts we have the president's outline explanation of the legal validity of the proclamation like all his reasoning it is simple and strong resting its authority on the war powers of the government and its justification upon military necessity as to the minor subtleties of interpretation or comment which it might provoke from lawyers or judges after the war should be ended we may infer that he had his opinions but that they did not enter into his motives of action on subsequent occasions while continuing to declare his belief that the proclamation was valid in law he nevertheless frankly admitted that what the courts might ultimately decide was beyond his knowledge as well as beyond his control for the moment he was dealing with two mighty forces of national destiny civil war and public opinion forces which paid little heed to theories of public constitutional or international law where they contravened their will and power in fact it was the impotence of legislative machinery and the insufficiency of legal dicta to govern or terminate the conflicts of public opinion on this identical question of slavery which brought on civil strife in the south slavery had taken up arms to assert its nationality and perpetuity in the north freedom had risen first in mere defensive resistance then the varying fortunes of war had rendered the combat implacable and mortal it was not from the mouldering volumes of ancient precedents but from the issues of the present wager of battle that future judges of courts would draw their doctrines to interpret to posterity whether the edict of freedom was void or valid when in the preceding june the crisis of the mcclellan campaign had come upon the president he had written his well-considered resolve i expect to maintain this contest until successful or till i die or am conquered or my term expires or congress or the country forsakes me grand as was the historical act of signing his decree of liberation it was but an incident in the grander contest he was commissioned and resolved to maintain that was an issue not alone of the bondage of a race but of the life of a nation a principle of government a question of primary human right was this act this step this incident in the contest wise or unwise would it bring success or failure would it fill the army weaken the enemy inspirit the country unite public opinion these we may assume and not a lawyer's criticisms of phrase or text dictum or precedent were the queries which filled his mind when he wrote his name at the bottom of the famous document if the rebellion should triumph establishing a government founded on slavery as its cornerstone manifestly his proclamation would be but waste paper though every court in christendom outside the confederate states should assert its official authority if on the other hand the union arms were victorious 
every step of that victory would become clothed with the mantle of law but if in addition it should turn out that the union arms had been rendered victorious through the help of the negro soldiers called to the field by the promise of freedom contained in the proclamation then the decree and its promise might rest secure in the certainty of legal execution and fulfilment to restore the union by the help of black soldiers under pledge of liberty and then for the union under whatever legal doctrine or construction to attempt to re-enslave them would be a wrong at which morality would revolt you cannot said mr lincoln in one of his early speeches repeal human nature the problem of statesmanship therefore was not one of theory but of practice fame is due mr lincoln not alone because he decreed emancipation but because events so shaped themselves under his guidance as to render the conception practical and the decree successful among the agencies he employed none proved more admirable or more powerful than this two-edged sword of the final proclamation blending sentiment with force leaguing liberty with union filling the voting armies at home and the fighting armies in the field in the light of history we can see that by this edict mr lincoln gave slavery its vital thrust its mortal wound it was the word of decision the judgment without appeal the sentence of doom but for the execution of the sentence for the accomplishment of this result he had yet many weary months to hope and to wait of its slow and tantalizing fruition of the gradual dawning of that full day of promise we cannot get a better description than that given in his own words in his annual message to congress nearly a year after the proclamation was signed when congress assembled a year ago the war had already lasted nearly twenty months and there had been many conflicts on both land and sea with varying results the rebellion had been pressed back into reduced limits yet the tone of public feeling and opinion at home and abroad was not satisfactory with other signs the popular elections then just passed indicated uneasiness among ourselves while amid much that was cold and menacing the kindest words coming from europe were uttered in accents of pity that we were too blind to surrender a hopeless cause our commerce was suffering greatly by a few armed vessels built upon and furnished from foreign shores and we were threatened with such additions from the same quarter as would sweep our trade from the sea and raise our blockade we had failed to elicit from european governments anything hopeful upon this subject the preliminary emancipation proclamation issued in september was running its assigned period to the beginning of the new year a month later the final proclamation came including the announcement that colored men of suitable condition would be received into the war service the policy of emancipation and of employing black soldiers gave to the future a new aspect about which hope and fear and doubt contended in uncertain conflict according to our political system as a matter of civil administration the general government had no lawful power to effect emancipation in any state and for a long time it had been hoped that the rebellion could be suppressed without resorting to it as a military measure it was all the while deemed possible that the necessity for it might come and that if it should the crisis of the contest would then be presented it came and as was anticipated it was followed by dark and doubtful days eleven months having now passed we are permitted to take another review the rebel borders are pressed still further back and by the complete opening of the mississippi the country dominated by the rebellion is divided into distinct parts with no practical communication between them tennessee and arkansas have been substantially cleared of insurgent control and influential citizens in each owners of slaves and advocates of slavery at the beginning of the rebellion now declare openly for emancipation in their respective states of those states not included in the emancipation proclamation maryland and missouri neither of which three years ago would tolerate any restraint upon the extension of slavery 
into new territories only dispute now as to the best mode of removing it within their own limits of those who were slaves at the beginning of the rebellion full one hundred thousand are now in the united states military service about one half of which number actually bear arms in the ranks thus giving the double advantage of taking so much labor from the insurgent cause and supplying the places which otherwise must be filled with so many white men so far as tested it is difficult to say they are not as good soldiers as any no servile insurrection or tendency to violence or cruelty has marked the measures of emancipation and arming the blacks these measures have been much discussed in foreign countries and contemporary with such discussion the tone of public sentiment there is much improved at home the same measures have been fully discussed supported criticized and denounced and the annual elections following are highly encouraging to those whose official duty it is to bear the country through this great trial thus we have the new reckoning the crisis which threatened to divide the friends of the union is past End of chapter nineteen